Higher Education releases results online. Sundown says no to tailings dam. And Morabe Treasury refuses payment. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for National MTV News. The 27,143 grade 12 students who applied for a place at the tertiary institutions in the country can now view their results online following the launch of the online selection system this morning. From this, only 9,371 students are eligible for a space at one of the tertiary institutions. The remaining 17,772 students will be left out. Anxious students and parents can now access results online using their unique login credentials given to them when they first registered in September this year. Unfortunately, not all will be happy. Many will be left disappointed as the tertiary institutions can only cater for 9,371. So my, my advice would be to those who have a lower marks, don't be discouraged. It's not necessarily your fault. Is the fact that the academic year was cut short and the exams were uh, designed in such a way that uh, maybe the content you didn't take it during your study because you missed a few months, not of your own accord. So don't be discouraged, just try to enroll through distance education and upgrade your marks. And you are in the system, so once your marks are upgraded, you, we will enter the marks into the system and uh, next year you will be eligible to, to apply. He says the selection was transparent and merit-based, with a grace period given in early December for students to make changes to their choices according to their grades. Because from September to the grace period, students make their choices according to their wishes. When we receive the final marks of grade 12 from the Department of Education, we immediately advise each student, that's your marks. Go back to your accounts, because we created for each student account. See your choices. See the requirements of the institutions. See the subject combinations. And try to make some changes. And Deputy Secretary of Research and Innovation Leah Magis explains how selectors and students can log into the admission pool. While the selection has been completed, I would like to invite selectors to please log into your online selection program accounts and please check the following. If your programs have already had a program yield, meaning quota yielded, you will, you will not see the admission pool. However, for programs whose quarters are still outstanding, we will activate the admission pool for you. This means if a student meets the requirement but is in the admission pool, you may be offered a space by the selector. It is important that students also check the national online application accounts. This is because as we speak, your results, individual results, should be there. Father Jan Feather added that COVID-19 had a huge impact on the performance of students this year. Newly appointed Minister for Higher Education, Science, Research and Technology, Wesley Raminai, as new as he is to this role, could only thank the department, the secretary and its hardworking staff for digitizing the selection process, saving the state millions of kina. It is what, bear in mind, is it not that the digitalization of student applications and online selection is saving the state 8.3 million Kenya annually. And I'd also like to, on this uh, occasion, I would also like to thank the brains who will be in this. Meantime, UPNG Vice Chancellor Frank Griffin explains how all institutions will look into the admission pool to admit the 18,000 plus students in the pool. So when the minister pressed the button 
activating the selection process uh, at least has now been generated. And following this press conference, we will be looking at those lists and seeing whether our quotas have been filled. If they have not been filled, uh, as we have seen from our statistics, um, we will then be able to look within our own schools and our programs and then look at the uh, admission pool from which we can draw from to complete our, uh, our quotas. However, they will also consider non-school leavers who have also applied for a space at the institutions. Ruth Rungula, National MTV News. The Sundown Provincial Government today announced their stance on the Frida River Mine Tailings Dam. They do not agree with having a hydro tailings dam. The Sundown Provincial Government presented the independent peer review of the Environmental Impact Statement to Conservation and Environment Protection Authority today. In the report, the Provincial Government declared their stance saying no to the integrated storage facility or the hydro tailings dam. People of Oshibik, all of us, um, the majority, 99% of us, we want to find. But we say no to them. That's the bottom line. Them, yeah, we don't know about them. We don't need them because. That's our livelihood, so we never know. Because from the past experience, like Octary, they, I think it, they did build a mine in um, them in Octary, but, but it did not last. So them, we don't to forget about them. This decision by the Sundown Provincial Government follows an independent peer review of the Environmental Impact Statement. The review highlighted enormous environmental and social implications that may result in the failure of integrated storage facility or the collapse of Hydro Tailings Dam. Focus Health and Safety Consultants identified some key facts supporting the decision to refuse the Hydro Tailings Dam. Among other reasons, the consequences of the Integrated Storage Facility or ISF dam failure is classified as potentially extreme under the guidelines provided by the Australian National Committee on Large Dams and the International Commission on Large Dams. There is also lack of information on risk intensity of ISF failure. The report goes on to suggest deep sea tailings placement or investigations into other alternative waste management options. The managing director for Conservation and Environment Protection Authority, Ganta Joku, explained that Frida Mine is classified as a level three mine and therefore the process is that SEPA will collate all views and pass on to the Environmental Council, an independent body that will then submit to the minister. So in terms of the civic development plan, we received the plan in um, November of 2018. And uh, on receiving the plan, we commenced our own internal assessment. So the internal ass assessment will be ongoing because uh, the law requires that we refer the impact statement to all stakeholders, those affected uh, by the project. And so in this case, the two provincial um, uh, governments, the East Pacific Provincial Government and the West Pacific Provincial Government. Uh, and um, I think the Provincial Governments uh, themselves will nominate areas where the impact statement uh, can be left, you know, in terms of the districts uh, and um, how they can, how the public can access those, uh, those documents. In the not too long distant future, I would like to basically have an audience with both the govern the governors of both East and West Sipi and the provincial government as to how we could collectively move forward free the river <coughs> developments. Meanwhile, Mr. Joku said SEPA's environmental assessment is ongoing and is open to the public to submit their views. Shamin Poriamba, National MTV News. The new Minister for Justice, Brian Kramer, is warning staff to commit to their work or face replacement. He was speaking to heads of the statutory agencies that report to the department. Attorney General Dr. Eric Kwa welcomed the minister and praised him for his charisma. From police to justice, the ministry has changed. Not the person and the attitude of the same minister. The first aim was at those that were not serious about their jobs. I look forward to working with yourselves, um, those that are committed to this job, committed to service of our people. 
We will get along extremely well. Whoever's in the system that shouldn't be here, that's creating roadblocks, we will come to pass and you will lose your job. That much I can guarantee you. Minister for Justice Brian Kremer getting the message right where he wanted it, to the heads of the statutory bodies. The message was a welcoming one for the new Attorney General, Dr. Eric Kwa. He assumes the role of principal legal advisor to government in the absence of a lawyer as minister. So we want to thank the Prime Minister for recognizing and acknowledging the contribution that uh, the Honorable Minister has been playing both um, as a former honorary member of parliament and then as the Minister for Police and now as the Minister for Justice. 99 pieces of legislation we need to review. We need to update them. We need to reform them. And so hopefully before the 2022 elections, we will work with you to push some of those reforms through. The acquaintance saw the handing over of a legal dictionary, which Dr. Kwa wrote and the keys of the building to Kremer. Top of the agenda for the new Minister for Justice was the outstanding payments owed to the administrators of law at the lower levels. So the same approach applies to the Justice Department. Obviously, our village courts need to get paid, which they haven't. Uh, Apart from this, the minister spoke of the rollout of the recently passed Independent Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC bill. The issue um, with ICAC getting its funding, but to, point at this, to give you an understanding of how serious uh, the Prime Minister's allocated me this task, that I said even the uh, parliamentary staff are going to be working on Christmas Day to certify, so they can get to the point of certifying the bill. They were talking about next year, January, I said that's too far away. Bradley Valenaki, National MTV News. Most often, victims of gender-based violence find it very difficult to open up about what they're going through. The establishment of the One Talk Counseling Helping Line is to allow victims to openly talk about their problems with confidentiality and without discrimination. Also, the counseling line gives advice on correct pathways to address some of the issues faced by the victims. Thanks to donor partners, this service is now available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The One Talk Counseling Helping Line is PNG's only national telephone counseling and support service. Counseling Helping Line was established in 2015 with um, initial funding from the New Zealand Government Aid Program to establish the first toll-free uh, counseling service in Papua New Guinea. The, the service has been made available countrywide for anybody who would like to call for assistance in terms of uh, gender-based violence-related um, situations. The service is now available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This new arrangement commenced on December 2nd, 2020. The service is available to anyone in PNG experiencing gender-based violence. The service hours have been extended in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has resulted in a steep rise in callers seeking support and also calls for the recognition of GBV as a prevalent issue in PNG. Most of the women lack the knowledge of knowing the services available around them and having the fear that they might not get that support. But we are all here to provide that support. Trained counsellors offer callers help on issues ranging from crisis counselling, safety planning and suicide intervention. People from all over the country can reach these professional counsellors via a toll-free digital number 71508000. When your call comes to here, be rest assured that it is just you and the counsellor. You don't have to give your name if you don't want to. And sometimes it is encouraging to talk about your issues. And the counsellors here are more than willing to sit and listen to your problems. The One Talk Counseling Helping Line was launched in 2015 by a partnership between Child Fund PNG and the Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee, or CIMC. Child Fund PNG is an international organization working in Papua New Guinea, and one of our key commitment areas is addressing violence against children and um, their families, particularly women and their and mothers. And We've been involved in this area of work for quite some time globally and here. And our interest then is actually creating an environment that um, is positive for children to 
grow and thrive. Since the establishment, the call center has received over 4,000 calls throughout the country. The number 71508000 is a toll-free number. Shamin Poriambe, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The newly elected chairman and board members of Small and Medium Enterprises Corporation, or SMEC, were sworn in recently. They include Chairman John Pora Schmidt, a local entrepreneur who has a background in corporate leadership and vast experience as an SME. The new board members were appointed by NEC at the beginning of this month. The eight new board members of SMEC include Chairman John Pora Smid, Deputy Chairman Milan Dirua, representing the Highlands region, Board Member Joseph Loghan, representing the NGI region, Board Member Party Simon Kingal, Banking and Finance Sector, Board Member Emmanuel Kange, Youth in Business, Ex Officer Connie Samuel from the Department of National Planning and Monitoring, Ex Officer David Ganai, Deputy Secretary for Policy and Administration, and ex officer Petrus Ralda, the Managing Director for SMEC. They were sworn in by Magistrate Seth Tani from the Waigani Comital Court. The individual board members have a variety of duties as members of the SMEC board and bring with them a wealth of knowledge and experience from the SME sector. That under standard review, we want to make sure that vertical alignment and horizontal integration, all is converging, they must be converging to Vision 2050, empowering the people, making PNG the richest black nation. And that is through this supporting the SME sector. SMAC is the mandated government agency that regulates policy for the SME sector and is responsible for the growth of local entrepreneurs and their businesses in Papua New Guinea. In 2020, much of SMAC's activities have been affected by COVID-19 restrictions. Board of Directors, your job is to go and look for the money, bring it back here, tell the management team what you need out of them. However, SMAC was able to carry out training of trainers to grow the SME sector and partner with other government agencies to assist local entrepreneurs expand their businesses or access funding support from financial institutions. So really, all of us are in a generational transformation period. Let's make it exciting. Let's enjoy it. We can. We're allowed to. And I hope the SME Corporation becomes one of the driving forces of that. With the swearing-in of the new board of directors, SMAC aims to expand its services to other provinces in Papua New Guinea. Sekla Gunga, National MTV News. Morabe's provincial treasury office in Leh refused to pay 130,000 kina in sitting allowances to a controversial debt service committee. The committee was established by the provincial government and approved by the provincial executive council in 2019 to identify debts owed by service providers and pay them. But in 2019, 250,000 kina was paid to the committee members as sitting allowances. Morbis Provincial Executive Council approved a payment of 138,000 kina as seating allowances for 10 members of the Provincial Government's Debt Service Committee for 2020. However, Provincial Treasurer Andrew Namuesh refused to release the payment. Namuesh said it's against the Public Finance Management Act to get extra allowances whilst working during the official hours. He said they could only claim overtime. The debt servicing committee did not come with the terms of reference which I require here in order for us to look at the terms of conference, the period of the uh, period of debt committee, what are the purpose of the establishment before we can up until now I have not seen any terms of reference from the debt servicing committee. In that committee they have established uh, to realize that they have 100 claims while we have so many claims outstanding. 
Our record, we have 300 claims. Their record is only 300. Uh, sorry, only 100. So they came up with the list without evidences. They don't have any records. Only the finance have the records of the payments. And this is the office that is the head of all the finances in the province. Therefore, any decision that is made by PEC has to be in line with the Public Finance Management Act. Because that's the highest act we have for the finances in the country. Earlier in 2019, Morbis Provincial Executive Council approved a payment of 1.5 million Kina investigation led by former Judge Don Sawong and Gamoga lawyers into claims incurred from 2012 to 2017 at a cost of over 44 million Kina. Without receiving a report from the investigation team, the PEC established a debt service committee whose job, according to the committee's name, is to identify debts owed by contractors and service providers and pay them. According to this document that was posted on social media, 250,000 kina of the taxpayers' money was paid to the 10 members of the debt service committee and police officers who were also involved last year. The members of the committee include a provincial political head who paid himself 15,000 kina, two deputy PAs who received 10,000 kina each, two female senior officers who were paid 15,000 kina each, three officers on the secretariat who paid themselves 10,000 kina each, two senior officers received 5,000 kina, a officer from the PSIP section paid himself 60,000 kina, 10,000 kina being on the committee as secretary, and 50,000 kina for a special case, and police officers involved also received 20,000 kina. In the beginning of a year, the budget is given to all the divisions. The division, when you want to expend your monies, you expend according to the budget you have. For Department of Morbe, they have overspent all the time in these years, and then they refer the, the outstanding to the debt servicing, which is not correct. And the provincial administrator must charge the officers for not using their budget properly in that year. The provincial treasurer says Morbe is the only province in the country that has a debt service committee. Namuyash has called on the PEC to abolish the debt service committee as it is a waste of taxpayers' money. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. The member for Tewa ICRC has accused the Morbe provincial government of misappropriating more than a million kina for the district over the last two years. He has since called on the governor and the provincial administrator to pay the half a million kina owed to the district for the construction of the Wasu Wharf. He said if the MPG can spend more than a million on brand new vehicles and pay hefty consultancy fees, they should be able to pay 500,000 kina for much needed services that will benefit two districts of Tewai CRC and Kabum. This PA one time, Governor, give us a money blow was who pay black promise life people like him or me. We don't have you black talks the money and pennies some black or next year. You blow you black and look at them all members long buy a car blow all process assembly, you black and buy a cost of ten, how much million million? Five hundred thousand there blow people some service here. Two blood to some service. Tell me, in a cabo. Give me, I don't want excuses. Already on the 400,000 with Pauline last year, Los Yassi, 400,000 with Michelle Pauline Pinis, now 500,000. That's why I made the project have no impact on this. And now looking at the Nasfund market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, Yokina is buying 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3613 Australian dollars, 0.3867 New Zealand dollars, and 28 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices, at New York closed gold is trading lower, coffee closed lower, cocoa and copra closed higher. Palm oil closed lower, crude oil is trading lower and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed higher, the ASX 200 is trading higher and the All Ordinaries is trading lower. National MTV News returns with stories making headlines overseas after the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the news. Turning over to the region, emergency teams are reporting widespread devastation in remote provinces of Fiji after Super Cyclone Yasa hit the island nation. The death toll remains at four, but that's likely to rise once the full extent of the damage is known. Fijian officials surveying the damage from the land as Kiwi and Aussie troops support from the air. Villages in northern Fiji have been flattened. This is all that's left of this man's home. But alongside the devastation, miraculous survival stories are emerging. When one 4x4 four four like this came from the ceiling, it nearly killed one child. The child was just uh, sleeping small two weeks baby. People were screaming, crying, shouting. Cyclone Yasa packed 340 kilometre an hour winds. At this school, people ran from building to building as roof after roof was torn off. The roof was lifting up, then they moved to Pimek. Then actually it happened again, then they moved to the various classrooms, up until they reached the staff room. Thousands remain in evacuation centres. Those who have returned are facing a wet clean-up, alongside no power or water supplies. Our government's sending aid as our NGOs and the United Nations is flying some in from Australia. We have uh, pre-positioned uh, items in uh, Brisbane which we are getting ready to fly out and uh, probably in the next uh, day or two we will have those supplies. Tents are already underway for the deployment of food rations, supplies and personnel to assist the affected communities. The worst affected areas are the Lao and Bua provinces, which took direct hits from Yasa. Access to villages there is proving difficult as roads and bridges have been destroyed. Fiji's government wants to get schools rebuilt within a month. have to get the buildings um, up in order or make alternative arrangements so that our students can uh, be back into classroom come 2021. For a fresh start after a year that brought Fiji two cyclones and a pandemic. Now, tomorrow brings the chance of something really worth remembering because it hasn't been seen for almost 800 years. For the first time since the Middle Ages, we'll be able to see the planets align in a spectacular way. Jupiter and Saturn have had a better 2020 than most, travelling together, ignoring the chaos on Earth. And tomorrow they're going to give us a Christmas show. Planets are constantly moving across our night sky, sometimes appearing very far from each other, other times appearing close. When they're close, that's called a great conjunction. It happened in 1623, but during daytime, so it was hard to see. This time it's at night, and the last time that happened was 1226, when Genghis Khan ruled the Mongol Empire. No one alive today has, uh, has seen this, so yeah, it's pretty rare. Around the world, space enthusiasts have been watching as the planets get closer. Tomorrow's the day, and here's how you can see it. I wait for the sun to set, and just to the right of where the sun went down, look up a little bit, and they'll be the first two points of light coming out of the, as the sky darkens. Astronomers say after the year we've had, the night sky is a good way to take our mind off things. And Jupiter and Saturn are the largest, brightest gas planets in our solar system. So maybe this conjunction is the bright light we need to shine us into 2021. And you guys brought us next. All the details with Kilawani after the break. Stay tuned. Sports. Good evening and welcome to Trukai Sports. The COVID-19 pandemic has put a halt to PNG Football Association's search for a new coach for the men's national team, the couples. With interest shown in the coaching position from candidates around the world, PNG FA looks to bring the couples' development back on track. A top priority for the PNG Football Association is the appointment of a new coach for the national men's team, the couples, as they embark through the Oceania regional qualifiers on the road to the FIFA World Cup, hosted by Qatar in 2022. PNG FA will be looking forward to move past recent disappointments regarding the couples, setting a new foundation for the team. 
thinking about bringing a foreign coach, but because of COVID-19 and all that, it's very hard. We've got about 10 or 12 applications already coming to uh, Secretary of Office, who wants to come and coach our team. Uh, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, so... In the interim, PNGFA will utilize their in-house coaches to conduct training camps for the couples, as the players maintain their fitness levels with basic drills. Our in-house uh, coaching instructor, Harrison Kamake, and uh, we also got Margaret Aka, who is also uh, coaching as well, instructors, so they will work together to try and uh, put a team together. We also got some coaches around here, but most of them must have B license. Most of them don't have B license, and we can't get them up to coach the national team, you know. That's, if we do that, then we're taking anybody, we're bridging ourselves. Yeah. So at the moment, uh, we wait until COVID-19 is end, and we may bring in a foreign coach. Haksti Lovai, Chukai Sports. The PNG Basketball Federation has just concluded its selection trials last weekend. The trials are an extensive approach of the Federation in efforts to find talent nationwide. PNG Basketball Federation's selection trials started on the 4th of December 2020 and concluded at the Sir John Guy Stadium in Port Moresby on Sunday, 20th December. The trials were run in Leh, Morabe Province, Goroka at the National Sports Institute and Port Moresby for the southern region. For Leh, it was more uh, suited for the uh, Momase region, so we expected uh, teams to travel in from Medang, Ramu, Yonki and a lot. Uh, Gorka was the same as well. We had uh, one or two players that came in from Yonki, otherwise the majority was from uh, Gorka Township. We also had uh, participants coming from Pangia, from uh, Mount Hagen um, and Mendy, yes. The rollout of the selection program noted an increase in participation and interest despite the COVID-19 challenges nationwide. In Lay alone, we had about 29, I think, 29 uh, um, participants that attended the trials in Lay. Uh, Groka, we had about 52, 52 um, and Port Mosby was the, the largest one. We had about 80. 30 women and 50 men that attended the trials. The purpose of the trials was to select a train-on squad for the Melanesian Cup, which will be held in Fiji later part of 2021. BFPNG Executive Officer, who is also part of the selections committee, Nick Dara, says the final list will be out shortly. The training team squads have been selected and will be endorsed and announced by Basketball Federation of PNG and the uh, list will, will, will then be disseminated through the uh, media, media channels. Currently, Papua New Guinea are the defending champions from the 2017 inaugural Melanesian Cup held in Port Moresby. We hope to uh, take the teams across to defend uh, their titles. Games in Fiji 2021 will be staged as qualifiers towards the Pacific Games, where the top two teams will qualify for the 2023 Pacific Games in Solomon Islands. And Trukai Sports continues after these messages. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To golf, Tiger Woods has welcomed his son to the golfing world in spectacular fashion at the latest PGA Tour. Making his debut, Tiger and son Charlie put on a show at one of the most highly anticipated days of golfing. Side of this hole. 11-year-old Charlie Woods taking dead aim as his dad proudly watches on. To work with. Oh, man. oh, what a shot! Team Woods combining in the best ball format to shoot a 10 under par round of 62. It was had so much fun being around one another and cheering one another on. It was the, the most perfect environment. This second shot. The one eagle on Team Woods card come in from all three shots from Charlie on the par five third. For the eagle. Look how proud Dad is. Tiger relishing the time on course with his son, reminding him of his late father Earl, who introduced him to the game of golf. I remember doing doing my dad. I was. 
was about 11 years old, the same with him. And it was the most perfect moment. But for Tiger, the most important thing is that Charlie loved what he's doing. Just the fact that he's able to enjoy being, whether it's golf or soccer or whatever environment he's in, making sure that he enjoys it. Team Woods trailing Matt Kuchar and his son Cameron by four shots. Oh, yes sir. No big deal. I got this, Dad. Charlie playing in his first TV event, keeping his routine as normal as possible. Keeping him away from doing all the obligations I have to do like this interview and um, he's out there hitting balls right now. Tiger momentarily protecting his cub before he lets him loose on the golfing world. Despite the influx of COVID-19 cases in Australia, one of the biggest names in tennis is set to take a trip down under for next year's Australian Open. Roger Federer is on track to make his long-awaited return from injury at the Grand Slam in February. The 39-year-old underwent knee surgery 10 months ago that kept him out of the clay court season before further complications ruled him out for the rest of 2020. Yeah. Every player, including Roger, uh, has made a commitment to travel to Melbourne to play. Uh, he did say to us he thought February the 8th was a more suitable date for him. Federer has played in 22 consecutive Australian Opens, winning six of them, his last coming in 2018. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports, the weather report for the next 24 hours after this break. Trukai Sports. <laughs> Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. A look at the weather forecast in the southern region. Fine weather, showers later in Port Moresby and Daru. Cloudy weather with a few showers in Kerama. Fine weather, partly cloudy later in Alitao. And a cloudy weather with some rain showers later in Popandita. In the New Guinea Islands, in the Momasa region rather, cloudy periods with rain showers later in Leh and Wau, cloudy periods with some showers in Medang and Wewak, cloudy periods followed by thundery showers in Vanimon. In the New Guinea Islands region, thundery rain in Lorengau, some showers then fine weather in Kaviang, cloudy periods followed by a shower or two in Kokoporobao, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, morning fog, then rain in Mount Hagen. Fine weather with some showers later in Goroka and Kundiawa. Cloudy periods with rain later in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that's been the news, sport and weather for Tuesday 22nd of December 2020. From all of us here at the newsroom, pleasant viewing, be safe and bye for now.